All right, so I was asked to talk about the whole topic around stigma and bias and, uh, uh, and the Canadian experience. I think we were certainly probably among the uh, uh, well, first national organizations that really took on weight bias and uh, stigma as one of our key, key issues. Uh, and so over the last several years, we've done quite a bit of work of this. Uh, in my talk, I want to focus really on the issue around bias and discrimination as it relates to the public health narrative, because I think the public health narrative has a huge impact on the way that the public thinks about obesity. It also has a huge impact on how politicians and policy people think about obesity. Uh, and that then translates into decisions that are made about the treatment aspect. And so, uh, you know, rather than talking about, you know, stigma in clinical care, I think it's, you know, it's important to take a much broader view of the issue. So I'll, I'll focus on that and I'll share with you some of the work we've done uh, in that area. Uh, I think it's crucial and this is probably true for any disease area, if you really want to have change and if you want politicians and if you want to advocate, uh, it's not the experts who get the change. It's usually the patients themselves. It's the people who care about patients. It's their families. Uh, and finding ways to engage patients to stand up for themselves and say, you know, enough is enough. We, you know, we don't see why we're being treated as second-class citizens here. You know, we pay our taxes like everybody else. We live in the society like everybody else. Uh, but if you have diabetes, well, then you get all the diabetes care. And if you have, if you get a stroke, you get all the stroke care. If you get cancer, you get all the cancer services. And here we are living with this disease and get nothing. Uh, and that's not fair. Uh, so framing obesity care and access to care as a social justice issue is actually you know, something that we've been pursuing. And I think we've got way more traction from pursuing access to obesity care and resources as a social justice issue and almost as a human rights issue than making arguments about saving costs or uh, even talking about, uh, you know, the fact that we can avoid health care costs down the road, et cetera. Uh, we, we tried that approach. It never got us anywhere. But now that we are starting to talk very to say, okay, if you don't want to provide services for people with obesity because you don't like fat people, but then say it. You know, don't give me excuses. And uh, that puts them into a very different type of position where they now have to sort of, they, they get pretty defensive when you use that argument. And uh, so we've had more traction there. Uh, I'll touch briefly on the issues around clinical dilemmas pertaining to obesity definition interventions because, and I, I already talked about it this morning, that you know, when we talk about obesity, we have to be pretty precise about what is it exactly that we mean. All right. Uh, there's no doubt that weight bias and discrimination is a, is a huge issue. And it doesn't matter what aspect of life that you look at, whether you're looking at access to education, whether you look at healthcare settings, whether you look at uh, even just social settings, community settings, getting on an airplane. Uh, I mean, there's no aspect of life that is not touched by the fact that we live in a fat phobic society and that we make it very, very difficult for people, you know, living with obesity uh, to actually partake in society even. Uh, and so that issue is now getting much more recognition. And I was actually very happy to see that a few, uh, actually it was earlier this year, uh, that the World Health Organization, at least the European division of the World Health Organization, actually put out this report where they, and, and this report is really worth reading because it's, it's, it's focused on the issue of weight bias and stigma as a health issue. Because this is not just a social justice issue. This is not just a question of, you know, uh, you know are we making pe people feel bad about them? So it actually does have health implications. So obesity stigma is a fundamental cause of health inequities. Everything that we've talked about, the fact lack of resources, lack of funding, lack of training, uh, lack of access to professional services, all of that ultimately comes down to weight bias and discrimination. Uh, and it adds a burden to the to lives of people that are already difficult. I mean, you're already kept in the excess weight, you're already dealing with sleep apnea, you already got your back pain, you've got your joint issues, you've got mobility issues, you've got <coughs> problems with acts of daily living. And then on top of that, you're carrying the burden of being discriminated against and people saying this is your fault. And, 
and, and, and you've done this to yourself. Uh, so the, you know, that puts you into a state of, you know, of, of, of anxiety and stress, and that has direct health consequences. Uh, we know that people not feeling good about themselves can lead to unhealthy behaviors. Uh, and there's lots of, lots of empirical data showing that when you, when you tell people this is about eating too much, they'll actually eat more. When you tell people you need to exercise, they will actually exercise less. And so a lot of our messaging is, it's, it's almost counterintuitive and we have to know about this. And there's a lot of literature on stigma and showing how people actually respond to this. But we have to be clear about the terminology that we use. So when we talk about weight bias, so weight bias is having a negative attitude and views about obesity and people with obesity. And that is a social construct. It is the construct that we have about what is obesity, what causes obesity, what drives obesity, what are the possible things you can do about obesity, the notion of personal responsibility, etc. When that is pervasive across society, uh, you know, those, that's, that's the bias that we have. And everybody has bias. We all carry bias against various things. You can have bias against people who have mental health. Maybe you have bias against people who have cancer. Maybe you have bias against people, you know, whatever the bias is. I mean, we all carry biases. Uh, and it's hard to get rid of biases, but you can always become aware of biases. And so we'll talk a little bit about biases, and we'll talk about some of the strategies on how you can actually become aware of them, because that's always the first step. Uh, Everybody in this room probably has some, some level of bias against, you know, people with obesity or some, we have biases against our own patients. Uh, stigma is the labeling and stereotyping and actually damages identities. And it's really deeply rooted in society. So the notions, the stories you hear, the narrative, the construct that you have around obesity, um, that, that's the weight stigma. Now, discrimination is kind of the behavior. That's what you then actually do. It can be verbal, physical, relationable. It can be subtle. It can be overt. Denying people services is a form of discrimination. Right? So that's where this then suddenly becomes a social justice issue and almost a human rights issue. You know, can you refuse treatments to someone just based on their size? Do we have a right of accommodation? Should we be able to accommodate people who have this problem? Because we accommodate all kinds of people. And in fact, we have bylaws and rules and regulations. Even in a building like this, there's what accessibility for people in wheelchairs and people who are hearing impaired and people who are sight impaired, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you know, as a society, and that is really one of the signs of a civilized society, is that you accommodate people who have special needs. People living with obesity have special needs. Are we accommodating them? If you're not, then we're discriminating. So those are the kind of things you want to think about in this context. So bias, the assumptions that you make lead to the stigma of obesity that, and that translates into behaviors which then becomes the actual discrimination. And like I said, this has real implications. There are public health consequences depending on how you discuss obesity in the public, what, the, what is your public narrative around what causes obesity, what drives it? And what is the role of individual responsibility in obesity? That is going to shape everything. The policy, the way the media is going to report about it, the way people talk about it, belief systems. That's going to directly impact prevention efforts, any policies you make around what can we do to prevent obesity, what can we do to support people living with obesity, those policies are going to be shaped by the assumptions that you make around what is driving the epidemic. And that can lead to health disparities. So we've got all these services for people who've got one condition, but we have no services for people who have another condition. Well, how do we make that decision? Where in the allocation of services and resources do these thoughts around obesity fit in. So, you know, and then you end up with social inequalities. But I think what has gotten more attention, and again, this is nothing new, this is something that's been around for a long time, is the direct individual impact that 
facing discrimination, facing bias, having to go out into the world that's not friendly to you, has direct physiological consequences for people and health consequences. It starts with just the anxiety that you have. You get up in the morning, you have this weight, and you know you're going to have to leave the house at some point. And you're going to have to get on a bus. And you're going to have to go to work. And then if you want to get a coffee and a standing in line, of, you know, you're being judged. Your stress levels are through the roof. And that leads to certain behaviors. It can lead to avoidance. You won't go to the gym because you know that if you go to the gym, you're going to be judged. And so you don't do it. You're more reluctant to seek health care because you know, when you go to see a doctor and ask for help, well, they'll tell you, well, you just need to lose weight. Right? So, the, so there's a direct consequence on individual people's health that directly comes from the fact that you live in a fat-phobic society. And, what, and, and, and that very much explains the kind of approaches that are taken in public health when you have public health discoveries. So when you, I mean, many of you have probably seen this, this kind of approach to childhood obesity. So this threatening approach, you know, we'll just keep telling you how bad it is for you. And that'll hopefully get you to change. When there's a ton of literature that it does the exact opposite. So the blaming, the shaming, the pointing fingers, the monocausal narrative about, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's sugar that causes obesity, or it's fast food that causes obesity. When in reality, we've got a pretty complex thing going on. Not everybody who you know, drinks pop has obesity. Not everybody who's, who doesn't move has obesity. But we don't talk about that. We, you know, you'd be, yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the tobacco anal analogy. In, in fact, any time you talk about obesity with any public health person, they're going to bring up tobacco. When they're completely different things. Like, I mean, tobacco is tobacco. And if you're going to bring up the tobacco analogy, you really don't know what you're talking about. Smoking is a behavior, and it's one agent. And the only reason we've got a handle on tobacco is because of the whole passive smoking story, because your smoking affects my health, so you're not allowed to smoke when I'm in here. And that then creates the possibility of passing the kind of laws that we've passed. It's not because to, to protect smokers. No, it's to protect the non-smokers. Well, you don't even have that story in obesity. Never mind that obesity is far more complex than smoking. In smoking, you regulate nicotine. How are you going to regulate highly processed foods? What's even the definition of a highly processed food? And how are you going to do it? And how are you going to do it in a way that you don't raise the cost of those foods for people who are dependent on those foods because they can't afford to eat other foods? How are you going to even address it? So the minute somebody brings up tobacco, I know they have no idea what they're talking about. I stopped listening. <laughs> I talked about this earlier. This is pointing fingers. When we talk about the burden of obesity, we're really trying to say obese people are a burden on society. How would you like it if somebody told you you're a burden on society? We don't talk of people who have cancer as being a burden on society. We don't talk of people who have Clinical depression is, oh, all these depressed guys, they're such a burden on the healthcare system. We need to get rid of depression. We need to stop, you know, people having heart attacks. They're such a burden on the healthcare system. If you could just stop people from having heart attacks, life would be so much easier for everybody. We don't talk like that about other diseases. So why is it that we pick obesity as saying, well, we gotta do something because it's costing so much money? Nobody ever argues, oh, we've got to do something about cancer because it's so expensive. We cannot afford to do chemotherapy on everybody. We need to really do something about the burden. I mean, these, all these guys living with cancer, I mean, wow. They need to stop doing this to themselves. Lots of cancers are preventable. Don't forget that. But we don't talk like that about cancer. But that's how we talk about obesity. So there are real implications to how we talk about obesity. And when we talk about what is driving obesity and what is the key reasons that, that we have this epidemic, it's that narrative that influences social thinking or public health thinking. And that's the public discourse around obesity. So the public health war on obesity tells the world that obesity is bad. 
Okay, but what does that mean? Well, that means that people who have obesity because it's bad, they were a burden on society. The narrative has an impact on the public perception of obesity. And it ties in with this narrative about, yeah, but fat people are fat because they don't eat, they eat too much food and they don't move enough and they, they, you know, they simply don't get it. We keep telling them how bad this is and we keep telling them that you know, they're doing this to themselves and yet they don't change. But that's your narrative. And I think the biggest problem is this narrative, that it's simple. You just, all you have to do to not have obesity is you need to eat less and you need to move more. And if you did this, you have no excuse for being fat. It's, it's, it's very easy. It's calories in and calories out. That's what it is. And that's what this actually means. When we talk about eating less and moving more as a solution to obesity, we're implying that people who have obesity have obesity because they eat too much and they don't move enough. And that squarely puts it on their shoulders. If you would just eat less and move more, you would not have obesity. So you're doing this to yourself. That's the narrative. Let's not talk about the science. Let's not talk about the genetics. Let's not talk about mental health issues. Let's not talk about social determinants of health. Let's not talk about any of those things. And let's not talk about the fact that you know, you're on medications that are causing weight gain. No, let's forget that. It's, it's, it's because you eat too much and you don't move enough. That's why you have obesity. If that's the narrative, well, then, of course, everybody's going to say it's your fault. The eat less, move more message makes it sound really simple. But you talk to anybody who actually has obesity and listen to them, it's never simple. There is no simple road to obesity. And then we say people are not motivated. Fat people don't care about their health. That's why they're fat. It's nonsense. Everybody cares about their health. And they're trying. And we've got a billion dollar weight loss industry out there for people trying to lose weight. Everybody's trying to lose weight. And they do it over and over and over again. Because we keep telling them it's simple. All you have to do is stop eating. So what a colleague of mine did back in Canada, and this is really how this whole thing started, when we started realizing and saying, you know what, the public health narrative around obesity is actually the problem that we need to address. We said, okay, let's look at how, does, how in a public health context, is, and it's well-meaning. You know, people who work in public health, they, they care. They want to improve the health of the population. They care deeply about these issues. But how, are, how is the way that they frame the problem contributing to the weight bias and discrimination that is actually making the problem worse for people living with the problem and is not bringing us closer to solutions. In fact, it's bringing us further and further away from solutions. So, we, so what we did was we, we looked at all of the publications from every ministry across the country on how do they talk about obesity, how do they, and, and, and everybody has a program. They have programs on you know, healthy weights and making people you know, healthier by getting them to move more and more active framing it very often as an obesity prevention or an obesity. So if you talk to any politician, what are you guys doing for obesity? Oh yeah, you know, we, we're going to make it, we're going to promote active transportation and we're going to tax sugars, sweetened beverages, and that's all, that's what we're doing. And when you look at, when you critically look at the language that's being used in those documentations and the way that the problem is being framed and the way that solutions to the problem are being framed, you actually see a certain things, there's a certain trend. The first thing is, nobody cares about adults. Anything anybody ever wants to talk about is childhood obesity. You meet with a politician, they want to talk about childhood obesity. Which is important, because yes, we do have an epidemic of childhood obesity, but here's the reality. The reality is that the vast majority of obesity you see in the population is not childhood obesity. The, vast, the peak age of incidence of obesity is in the 40s. Most people living with obesity were not obese kids and did not have a weight problem till mid-adulthood. That's when it starts. It starts in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s. And it does not matter how active you were as a kid and it doesn't matter with the, yeah, I do an adult clinic. The patients I see in my clinic did not grow up you know, with screen time and I've got former competitive athletes in my clinic 
who spend hours competi competitive sports, perfect diets, and then something happens. And the next thing you know, they've gained 60 pounds. So all that exercising, all that healthy eating did absolutely nothing to prevent their obesity. But we totally forget that and ignore it because we're all obsessed about childhood obesity because that might get us some votes if you focus on it. And the way we'll do it is we'll, we'll blame the parents. In fact, we'll discuss whether we should take those kids away from, from, the, from their parents as a solution. I mean, those are the kind of discussions you have. And it's all about eating less and moving more. We're not talking about mental health. We're not talking about the social determinants of health. We're not talking about obesogenic medications. We're not talking about sleep deprivation. We're not talking about cultural changes that drive the epidemic. We live in a culture of grabbing bites. I always say, if you feel like grabbing a bite, don't. That's not a good way to eat. We frame the fast food problem as a food problem, when in reality, it's a time problem. If McDonald's took 45 minutes to serve your hamburger, nobody would go there. <laughs> right? It's not the food. It's the fact that you live in a society where everybody's pressed for time. Why? Because you have to work three jobs and then go home and look after your kids. And you've got a two-hour commute because you can't afford to live downtown next to where you work. Nobody talks about that. No, let's make this about fast food and soft drinks and let's talk about that. Right? Because I don't even want to talk about the other stuff. Because I, I wouldn't know where to start. And at a, at, at a cerebral level, when you talk to people in public health, oh yeah, we understand the social determinants of health. I'll show you maps like the one we saw this morning that you know, you'll see, you know, it's highly prevalent in Western Sydney, and if you look at North Sydney, it's not there, and that's the socioeconomic. Yeah, they know that. Everybody knows that. But if being of low socioeconomic status is driving obesity, then start thinking about how you want to address the social determinants of health. Well, that's a whole different topic. No, it's much easier to talk about, oh, let's, you know, let's, ta let's tax fast food. We're not going after the deter determinants. Then we've got this whole concept of healthy body weights. As if you can step on a scale and decide whether someone is healthy or not. I might mean, talked about it all morning. And when you ask somebody, what is a healthy weight? And how do you even define a healthy weight? And the data that shows that people can actually be pretty healthy across a wide range of weights. Yeah, I've got people with BMIs of 35 who's got lots of health problems, but I also have people with BMIs of 19 who've got all kinds of health problems. So what's a healthy weight? But you keep seeing healthy weights, ideal weights, keeps coming on. The refusal to frame obesity as a disease. Let's keep talking about a risk factor. Now the consequences of that are if it's a risk factor, it's on you. How do we get away with not training doctors to manage obesity or even know about obesity? Well, because it's not really a disease. You know what? I'm a medical doctor. I, I go to medical school and I treat medical diseases. That's what I'm trained for. That's what I'm paid for. The minute you actually say it's a disease, well, suddenly this becomes my problem. And I, I remember I showed you this, the slide about the Canadian Diabetes, uh, 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 the Canadian Medical Association saying obesity is a disease. There was a huge debate about this. Doctors don't want this to be a disease. Why? Because when you make it a disease, it becomes my job. I don't want to do this. I hate fat people. I don't have time for this. I don't get paid for this. I don't have the tools. I don't know how to do it. So please do not make this a disease. Because I don't want to do this. Right? So the opposition comes right from there. That, that's where your bias and your discrimination starts. I don't want this to be a disease. And I'll use all kinds of excuses for not making it a disease. I'll say, oh, you're going to open the floodgates. So suddenly we've got to treat all these millions of people who have to, Well, we treat millions of people who have other diseases. Comes back to weight bias and discrimination. Oh, and people with obesity 
We never actually engage them and ask them, what would you like to see happen? What do you think? What do you think is the one public health measure that we could do that, you, that would actually help you? Nobody's ever asked them. Because they're not involved. We, we, we're deciding what is going to be best for them. So some of you just mentioned paternalistic approach to, to the whole epidemic. Yeah, we know what's good for you. We just need to get you to do it. And in a public health context, until very recently, nobody was talking about even waste bias and stigma. It just wasn't a topic. No, we'll talk about healthy weights and healthy eating, and we'll have a new website with healthy cooking recipes. That's going to solve the problem. Nonsense. You don't even know what you're talking about. Because you just have to ask people living with the problem, what do you think is, is the problem? What do you think caused your obesity, and what do you think is going to actually help you? The first thing people tell me, well, this, this whole eat less, move thing, I've tried it, doesn't work. Yeah, I lose some weight and then the weight comes back. I've been trying that all my life. I'll try it again if you want me to, but hey, I've done it before. The whole weight-centric, to say, there, you know, there's this healthy weight that everybody has to be at. This is like, you know, let's make everybody of the same height, you know, because being too tall is not good for you, short is also not good, you know. <laughs> let's find ways to do that. It's nonsense. But ultimately, it's the eat less, move more narrative around obesity that creates the entire environment and the judgment about individuals of obesity. If it's that simple, then you must be really stupid or totally unmotivated because you simply don't get it. And clinically, we've known forever that it doesn't work. I mean, telling someone with obesity to eat less is like telling someone which, you know, depression, you know, you, you need to cheer up. <laughs> and you can come, you know, we can talk about this. And in fact, you know, if you go back a couple of decades, that was the treatment for depression. You would come in and we'd do talk therapy. I'll try to talk you out of your depression by telling you what a great life you actually have and how there's all these people that, that, whose life is way worse. Like, I don't know why you're depressed because, you know, that depression I get, but, you know, look at your life. What's your excuse? Okay. When did that change? Well, that changed when suddenly depression became a disease. How did the depression actually become a disease? When we started talking about molecular biology. Now suddenly we make depression into an imbalance between serotonin and dopamine, and now everybody gets it. Oh yeah, I understand, okay, okay. And now you can show, well, you know what? There's a, there's a, there's a down-regulation of dopamine receptors and everybody understands. And there's actually genetic variants of those receptors that will make some people more prone to depression than others. Oh, now I get it. It's not rocket science. And the whole risk factor approach is not consistent with the clinical narrative that obesity is a chronic If I keep talking about obesity as a risk factor, I'm not getting closer to making it a disease. And I know that people who are in public health, yeah, they worry about populations and they worry about prevention. That's their job. But what other disease area is there or what other health problem is there where we only talk about prevention? Take cancer. Yeah, we need to increase you know, funding for cancer treatments and access for cancer. No, no, that's not what we need. What we need to do is we need to do more cancer prevention because then we don't have to pay for all the cancer. No, that's not what we do. We talk about cancer prevention, and we do what we can for cancer prevention, but we're also treating cancer. You know, we try to prevent heart disease, but we also treat heart disease. We try to prevent diabetes, but we treat diabetes. You do both. But only in obesity do we all say, we don't need obesity treatment. Why? Because we're just going to do prevention. Well, we've been talking about prevention for 40 years, and the problem has only been getting worse. So at what point... Do we say, okay, enough talk about prevention, let's actually start worrying about the... I mean, a lot of people living with obesity, they're going to be, they're going to be long gone by the time we get an, our act together in terms of prevention. Right? So how can you... But nobody wants to talk about access to treatment. No, but let's talk more about prevention. And again... Let's make all these decisions about what it is we, that we think fat people need to do, because, but we don't have to ask them. You know, we don't engage them in the discussion even. Lived experience, who cares? 
We just eat too much. So we've actually come up with a whole set of recommendations for public health to deal with the issue of weight bias and dogma. And the first one is public health and anybody speaking about obesity needs to recognize the impact of their words and their presentation and their framing of the problem on the issue of weight bias and discrimination. You need to become consciously aware of what, does it, what are the implications of presenting obesity as a simple problem of people eating too much and not moving enough. And let's blame it all on the fast food industry. Oh, it's that simple. Ban McDonald's and there's no more obesity. It's that simple. And once we recognize that obesity, weight bias, stigma, discrimination is a lived reality of our patients, of the people we care about, and is affecting their health, well, then we need to study it then we need to start monitoring it. And we have to look at what is the impact of weight bias and discrimination on people living with the issue. And then we can maybe start creating around policies that will actually prevent and eliminate obesity. So if we can't eliminate obesity, because I don't know how to do that, at least let's eliminate weight bias. And I don't know how to do that either, but we can definitely eliminate discrimination, because that's a behavior. And as a public health person, you have to look at the unintended consequences of chronic disease prevention activities on the lives and experience of children and youth with obesity. You have to understand the unintended consequences of the simplistic obesity narrative, that that is actually harming people. That's part of the problem, that we keep saying, oh, yeah, it's, it's fast food. It's processed foods. That's what's causing the problem. Oh, it's that simple. Oh, it's so processed foods, and I get it. Now let's forget the whole biology. Don't even have to think about it. That's fast food, that's what it is. And then we have to start thinking about what are, the, what are the core beliefs, the values, the practices, the relationships, the language that we use, and how does all of this contribute to weight bias and stigma and shape the narrative? And we've actually come up with a checklist that you can download from, from the Obesity Canada website where you can actually have a set of criteria when you have a public health policy around obesity or around healthy living. You actually look at the policy, look at the health, you know, look at the language that's being used and the story that's being told regarding what are the assumptions that are being made about people living with obesity and what are the assumptions that are being made here. And remember, most of the data that we have when we talk about here's what we think at a population level is causing obesity, it's all correlational data. And the first thing you learn in a statistics course is that a correlation does not prove causality. And yet we're making all these assumptions about what's causing stuff. Because, yeah, you know, here's a graph. Here's how much fat people eat. And here's how little thin people eat. And so it must be the amount of food that they're eating that's causing obesity. And I'll turn that around and say, no. Large people eat more food because they have larger bodies that, have, that require more calories. So now we've got reverse causality, if there's any causality at all. Where do, who gets blamed for all of this? Everybody wants to find. We want to find who we can blame for this. Our obesity public health strategy is sensitive to the needs and the concerns of the people that we are actually trying to help. Or are we in reality not even trying to help them? We just want to get rid of them. You're a burden on society. We want you out of here. And we definitely don't want the next generation because oh, they're going to, that's going to be even worse. What are the stereotypes that are being promoted by that narrative? What's the language we use when we talk about obesity? Are we using people first language? So in Obesity Canada, we put together this Everybody Matters collaborative, which is not just about raising awareness about weight bias and discrimination, but is actually starting to say, okay, then what can we do about it? What is the literature and what is the research on bias and discrimination, which exists for a lot of other conditions. But there's learnings there. And how can we take those learnings, and how can we take the science and the literature around bias and discrimination, and start thinking about applying that to the obesity issue? 
So we've just had our third conference about this issue. The first one was about six or seven years ago. Two days. And we brought in the experts. We brought in the experts who dealt with issues around weight bias and discrimination in mental health, in HIV AIDS, in diabetes, in illicit drug use. There are experts out there who understand weight bias and discrimination, who've done the research, who understand how these things work. I want to give you in the next couple of slides just some of the themes that came out of these conferences, some of the key discussions. There is a direct cost, there's a human cost and there's an economic cost to weight bias and discrimination. It's not just, you know, social justice issue. No, there's a, there's a real cost. So if you want to say, well, we have to do something because, it's so much, because it costs so much, well, weight bias costs a lot. So what are we doing about it? And that brings us back to the issue around definitions. We're not against fat people. I don't care about people's size. I care about, we care about health. So then let's make it about health. And then let's really make that distinction between what do we actually mean when we talk, when we make a clinical diagnosis of obesity, who are we actually talking about? Do we want to label everybody above a certain BMI as sick, as living with a disease? When we know that not everybody above a certain BMI has a disease and not everybody below a certain BMI is disease free. So how do we frame that? How do we discuss that? And where in this whole discussion do we talk about respect, dignity? And this goes beyond the healthcare system. This is education settings, employment settings, community settings. Do we even know what's going on there? Well, we don't because we don't ask the people who live this every day. And we know from the weight bias and from the bias and discrimination literature that there's no single way to approach this. There's no magic formula to addressing this, but there are good practices and there are best practices and there are a whole bunch of things that can be done around this. And education is important, but it's not enough. But it starts with awareness. But once you have the awareness, then you can educate yourself. And the problem with obesity is the more you learn about it, the more complex it gets. And then things become very, very counterintuitive. And we can talk about that because there's lots of learnings there. And then we need champions. Then we need role models. Then we need to pe people coming out and speaking about their stories. Because it's when you start hearing individual stories <laughs> that the stereotype suddenly breaks down. You know, we were talking about what 60% of folks in your clinic sexual abuse histories. No, that's just an excuse. In reality, they're just eating too much processed food. That's a real problem. They're just using the fact that they were sexually abused as an excuse. No. Right? How do you frame the problem? How do you talk about the problem? The more we make this about lifestyle and choices and individual responsibility, the more it's okay to blame people, right? If it's a, well, you chose to be fat, sorry. You chose to be 100 pounds heavier than you should be. You made those choices, now live with the consequences. That's basically what we're telling people. And so there is an urgent need for activism. And every single disease area, you can go back to HIV AIDS, you can go to mental health, you can go everywhere. The only way that you will ever get attention and acceptance and access to care is by becoming an activist. And I see that as part of my job. And the best way to address this is to actually take real narratives and real stories from real people and present them. Because when you hear those stories, you say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I understand why this person is 200 pounds. I understand that there was a motor vehicle accident, there was a head injury, there were seizures, there was anti-seizure medications and there was a 100-pound weight gain. I get it. Suddenly the story makes sense. Or here was the young girl who had a sexual assault and gained 60 pounds after that. Here's the veteran who came back from Afghanistan 
dealing with PTSD and the way it's gone up. Here's the person who, you know, at 35 lost their job, marriage broke up, couldn't find another job, got depression, gained 60 pounds. That makes sense. Every, sto every, every patient has a story, and they're all different. And we in the obesity community can learn from the other people who have successfully addressed bias and stigma, and they've de dealt with this. I mean, obesity is not the only condition that, you know, that people face stigma, bias, and discrimination. So we realized quite early on, it's been now five, six, seven years ago, we've got to engage people living with obesity. But they don't step forward. If I keep telling you this is your fault, you're going to be the last person on the planet to reach out for help. Well, why would you? Because it's your problem. You've done this to yourself. You can undo this problem. You just have to get smart. Stop eating all that processed food. You know, go out and exercise. You can do it. And if you don't do it, sorry, I can't help you. You don't deserve help if you're too stupid to do it. Too lazy. No self-control. If you're so weak-willed that you cannot make proper decisions about food, well, then you don't deserve better. It's not helping anybody. So we put together a patient engagement committee. And we now have every single committee within Obesity Canada has patient recommendation. Every single committee has somebody who has the lived experience sitting there with the experts. You know, people call me an obesity expert. I have zero expertise in living with obesity. I've never lived with obesity. Now, I don't have to. I mean, you don't have to be a cancer survivor to be an oncologist. But, I mean, I can understand the science, but I don't know what it's like to live with 40 extra pounds. You do. I don't. <laughs> 40 kilos. <laughs> Involvement in educational events, engagement in social media, rate of living, public speaking, advocacy training. It's not enough to have people who want to advocate. Well, they have to know how to advocate. You, and to be able to advocate, you need to understand how government works. Simply talking to the minister, you know, is not going to change anything. But there are strategies for this. There were lobbyists. There's a whole profession of how you actually get policy people to do policy. You've got to engage them, listen to that, train people, get them to understand what is it going to take to change this. Even the research that we do is rarely informed by patients themselves. I don't know about Australia and Canada, now there's this huge movement towards you know, patient-oriented research. So all the research projects that you, if you make a research proposal now that involves people, you need to have patients there and you need to have to actually document that you know, you've had focus groups with patients and that this is, what they, this is the question that they would like to see answered. And then you get funding for your research. If that's not a question patients are interested in, you're not going to get research funding. If you want to know more about the Everybody Matters uh, thing, you, you, can just, you can just Google Everybody Matters or go to the Canadian Obesity Network website. You'll get the reports. you get reports from all the three meetings. There's action plans. There's all kinds of stuff. All right. So how do we change any of this? So you have to think about what are the key messages that we want people who have, are in a position to make a difference to understand. So you think about this, and, and we're just going to focus on the health issues here. Who are your audiences, and what do you want them to know about the problem? So when we talk about the health world, well, we've got our patients. They need to understand the problem. They're all busy blaming themselves, which is not helpful, because they, when they, you blame yourself and when you think this is my fault, then you're not reaching out for help. And in fact, you're too embarrassed to ask for help. You know, because then, bariat then having bariatric surgery is taking the easy way out. Right? There's, there's, I mean, this is probably one of the only disease areas where there is stigma attached to actually getting treatment. There's no stigma involved in getting a bone marrow transplant when you have leukemia. There's no. You know, people who have had bypass surgery, coronary bypass surgery, they'll tell you. It's almost like they're proud to have had it. 
Patients who have gastric bypass surgery won't even tell their spouse. They'll make up stories about why they're eating less because of allergies or whatnot. They'll, have, they'll avoid social situations where they get questioned about their eating habits. Why? Because they don't want to tell anybody. Why? Because they're too embarrassed. Or you're taking a medication for weight loss. You know, you know, this whole story about, you know, you see someone, they've lost weight, and you say, wow, you look great and everything. So what did you do? Oh, I had bariatric surgery. Oh. You didn't do the work. Why would you tell anybody? Okay. So, policymakers. We have to stop tolerating weight bias. We see it from our colleagues. We see the way people are being talked about. Even patients against each other. Oh, my obesity is because of my accident, but these other fat guys, you know, they're just lazy. Right? So, a lot of that can, you can address with education, using the proper language. In the education, again, it starts in school. Weight bias and discrimination starts in kindergarten. So in the education settings, we also have to start thinking about how are we going to change the narrative there. Policy. Again, let's look at the documents, let's look at the policies, let's look at the discussion. How is this being discussed? There's lots, there's lots to be done. So we've just published the, uh, this was our second report called on access to treatment. I can tell you it's dismal. Access to surgery, access to multidisciplinary care. I mean, you take, you know, take everything that's in the practice guidelines and say, well, what if that is actually being provided? Nothing. Okay. So how are we going to change that if people say, well, you know, we don't really need to do something about, oh, because, you know, don't worry about treatment. We're working on prevention. You know, just hold your breath till we get there. So when we look at the public resources that are out there on, our, on, on the Obesity Canada website, it's all about educating and talking about, you know, all these factors that can, that can promote obesity, not just about health risks and you know, and here's a healthy recipe and here's a exercise plan. No, it goes way beyond that. So there's all kinds of resources. There's, there's little videos, mythbusters, weight of living stories. I think the weight of living stories have been the most effective ones. Those are the ones where you can actually get people behind you know, when they actually hear the stories of people who have been living with obesity, often their whole lives. But often it happens to people, right? It can happen at any time. As an organization, Obesity Canada has been conducting a whole bunch of public engagement activities. In fact, one of the next activities I'm going to after this meeting is a public workshop. But again, you're changing the narrative. Advocacy. In February, we spent, we spent three days on Parliament Hill meeting with politicians of every party. And we had a scientist and we had a health professional and we had a patient. And we divided up into groups of three and we went to all from one appointment to the next. And here's the good news. People are willing to listen. Everybody's interested. They just don't know. You just have to tell them. So here are our advocacy priorities. Obesity awareness and education, of course. We need obesity to be designated as a chronic disease because my firm belief is, is that until we clearly accept that obesity is a chronic disease, we are never going to have the resources. And we are always going to use excuses for not prior providing those resources. And that's what everybody is afraid of. They're, they're afraid of the political consequences of saying it's a disease because the minute you say it's a disease, this suddenly becomes your job. And it certainly also means that now health systems have to provide the resources. And that's why they're not doing it. It's not, it's not because obesity is not a chronic disease. And behind closed doors, people say, yeah I, yeah, I can see why this is a chronic disease. But don't ever ask me to say that in public. Okay, let's keep pretending it's not a disease, and then we don't have to do anything about it. And it's not that people living with obesity are, you know, are, are asking for more than people living with any other chronic disease. 
But right now, if you look at any, almost any other chronic disease, you look at diabetes, look at the resources, look at the infrastructure that's there, look at the infrastructure you've got for cardiovascular disease, for any other disease, for that matter, even for diseases where there's no good treatments, you still have an infrastructure. Where's that infrastructure for obesity? Well, we don't need it for obesity because obesity is not really a disease. It's just people eating too much processed foods. If they would just stop eating those foods, we wouldn't have to provide those risks. Right? So as long as you keep framing it as a problem of people eating too much and not moving enough, you're never going to get the resources because if that's your story, then you don't need the resources. You just have to get people moving. You just got to have to, you know, they need to smarten up. You know, stop harming themselves. So weight bias and discrimination is more than a social justice issue. It has a direct impact on policies. It has a direct impact on the help that our patients get. And that's why it's the central, it's an, it has an impact on research funding, those of you who do research. Why do you need money for research for obesity? Well, what the hell are you researching? We know what causes obesity. It's eating too much and not moving enough. So what do you want to research? You want to count, count how many hamburgers they're eating or what's your research project? Well, if that's the narrative, why would anybody give you research money? But when you start making it about neuroscience and you say, well, we need to understand, if we don't actually understand the biology of the set point, we don't actually understand the interaction between the hedonic system and the homeostatic system, we don't really understand how all of the pathways of the limbic system map to appetite control, we don't really fully understand how the frontal part of your brain actually takes control of other parts of your brain that are going to you know, influence ingestive behavior. We don't fully understand all of the pathways all of the biochemistry of all the pathways that your body has to resist weight loss. Well, we don't need to study any of those things because well, that's biology. Who cares? You know, this is all willpower. We just need to give people healthy eating recipes. You know, teach people to cook. We'll solve the problem. Well, if that's your story, good luck. We've got to move away from the lifestyle narrative. The more we make this about lifestyle, the further and further and further we get from a solution. And the, interestingly, there's actually randomized controlled studies on how do you reduce weight bias. And this is a, I, I don't have a slide on this, but you can look this up and I'll send you the reference. They took a bunch of students and they randomized them into two groups. And they measured implicit weight bias in all of these, and there's tools for doing that. And then one group got a one hour lecture on healthy eating and activity, and how the cause of the obesity epidemic is eating too much and not moving enough. And the other group got a one hour lecture on the role of genetics, on the role of epigenetics, on the role of endocrine disruptors, on the role of the neuroscience of appetite regulation. They talked about incretins. They talked about the biology of adipose tissue. They talked about the social determinants of health. And after an hour of listening to those lectures, they redid the test on weight bias. And guess what? The people who listened to a whole hour-long talk about eat less and move more actually hated fat people even more. In the other group, it wasn't a statistical significant, but it was an average decrease in implicit bias because you were not talking about diet and exercise. So I think we need to stop talking about diet and exercise. We're not helping anybody. We are not helping ourselves. We've been talking about diet and exercise for the last 100 years, and nothing has happened. And we need to make sure that people understand that the things that we are discussing for health promotion are not treatments for obesity. The things I do to prevent cancer are different from the things that I do to treat cancer. The things that I do for preventing heart disease are not the things that I do to treat heart disease. They're different. And I can't tell you which one is more important. They're both important. 
the things we do to prevent obesity are not the things that will work to treat obesity. They're different, and we need to do both. And that's what we need to be talking about. Whenever somebody says, yeah, but what about prevention? I say, yeah, but what about treatment? Those are the conversations we need to be having. And if you want more resources for doing the kind of work that you're doing, addressing weight bias and discrimination, and changing the public narrative around obesity has to be your number one priority, because otherwise you're never going to get those resources. And I can't tell you whether you'll ever get them, because we haven't gotten them yet. But we are starting to see change. But it's upon us to change the narrative. And the people who can help us are our patients. We need to listen to them, we need to engage them, and we need to give them a forum, we need to put them on a pedestal, and we need to get their message out. And we can amplify those messages, because we hear those messages every day in our clinics. We just have to get them out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aria, for sharing uh, the, uh, your experience back in uh, Canada. And, and Obesity Canada is very much leading the way forward, I believe, uh, as a country in terms of um, overturning or uh, reducing uh, the, the, the bias and stigma associated with obesity. And in fact, it was a, it was a great way to finish our forum uh, as, I, as I began our forum in terms of the frustration that all of us uh, uh, find and experience in, in uh, the general lack of accurate information about the causes of obesity in the public discourse. Hi, thank you very much. That was a great talk. I'm Shirley Alexander. I'm the head of weight management services at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. So this is more um, a comment rather than a question. Um, I think it's fantastic that you think that childhood obesity is all anyone ever talks about because from our perspective it's hardly ever recognised. Um, so we'd love that to be the case um, and we do see it as a major problem. I've been in this area for 10 years when I first started. Uh, you know, we, I saw a three-year-old that was 33 kilograms. I thought that was terrible. We now see three-year-olds that are 67 kilograms. We've got an 11-year-old that's 192 kilograms and, you know, 15-year-olds that are 210 kilograms to the extent that we had to ask our IT to be able to put that on the growth chart, actually. So, you know, we would really say, this is a generation coming through that have major problems. I just got a, a, um, a, a news article about a 13-year-old um, being uh, dying from complications of obesity in the UK. And we do see it as, you know, um, we, we see it as a problem that people don't actually even recognize as a problem from a clinical perspective and the parent perspective. And we would like to um, see much more of that sort of recognition. And there, there is some talk about it, but there's often no resources there's behind no action, it yeah. because the parents don't see it as a problem often themselves. Um, so that was just my, my little comment. I'd love people to talk about it more if you could, but thank you. I think uh, I think what you're doing with you know getting rid of stigma nationwide is amazing. I wish Australia could could follow in that in suit in, in time. Yeah, don't get me wrong, we're not there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, when one of the I guess one of the issues that I find is we we do try to I feel like as clinicians we try to take some of that burden from patients. You know, you've been trying all this. We try to absorb some of that from them, so we remove the feelings of guilt a little bit. We try to take some of that burden. You know, you know, we try not to be too paternal, paternalistic or maternalistic, but we, we do try to take some of that um, burden they, that they're carrying onwards, that, that, uh, that they're carrying on board. I guess at the same time, you don't want to, I mean, at what point do you, have you gone too far? I mean, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, you, if you say it's not your fault, it's yeah. not your fault, it's not your fault, it's your genes, it's your, it's your situation, you've been abused, you've been, but at the same time, I feel like, if we do that too much, we may actually de-equip them because yeah. then they'll not be able to do anything about it. Sure. So at this point, I'm not concerned about going too far because we haven't even started moving. Uh, <laughs> it, sure. It's, um, but, but, you know, earlier this year, I was actually in the UK. Uh, I mean, you would wonder that the UK even had time to discuss it because they're so occupied with Brexit. But uh, we were actually in a parliamentary hearing. They had an all-partisan um, committee on addressing obesity, and this whole issue came around about let's call it a disease or not. And the minister, the health minister at the time, uh, he resigned two days later, but not because of this, uh, 
actually said, he raised a similar point. He said, well, we can't make it a disease because once you make it a disease, then people, that means that people have no responsibility and then that's an excuse for them to do nothing. I said, okay, what other disease is it that you know of where because it's a disease, patients no longer have a responsibility? I mean, if you're being diagnosed with diabetes, well, then you do have a responsibility. You do need to, you know, improve your diet, and you do need to take your insulin, and you do need to monitor your blood sugars, and you do need to go for your checkups, and you do need to educate yourself about it. I mean, that's a patient responsibility. If you're living with heart disease, you have a responsibility as a patient, right? And why is it that when we talk about obesity, we think that if you call this a disease, people are going to stop worrying about it and say, oh, God, now it's, oh, it's a disease, so thank God, now I don't have to do anything. No, that's not how people, not, but other diseases respond. I mean, there's always a responsibility for patients, right? And I think what's important, however, is that we take the judgment out of this discussion. I mean, you only have to spend a couple of hours in the emergency room and see every patient who walks through the door with a problem, and I can tell you that most of the problems, you're kind of rolling your eyes internally thinking, well, oh my God, okay, here we go again. Okay, whether that's somebody who got into a car accident, whether that's somebody who forgot to take their medication, whether that's somebody who did whatever they did. I mean, most of this stuff is self-inflicted, could have been avoided if people were smarter. Okay, and yet we provide services to all these people. And in fact, we are professionally trained to try and not discriminate against people. I mean, yeah, you might, not, you might think people who are, you know, who have mental health issues, oh, come on, you know, get a handle on that. And yet you professionally approach them and you professionally treat them. You don't have to disagree or agree with anything. But if people feel judged, they're not going to come to you for help. And that's what we want. We want people to come to us for help because we think, well, we don't have great tools, but we do have some tools. Uh, but they're not going to come to you if they feel that they're being judged. And so I don't, I'm not afraid of going too far in that <laughs> direction. I, you know, I want to be... Uh, and, you know, and, and part of why you see people break down in your clinic is, oh, Dr. Sharma, you're the first guy who ever actually, you know, said it was a chronic disease. Or, and I tell people, I say, you know what, this, we don't have great treatments. We've got a few treatments, and we can discuss those, and we can try them, but I wish we had better treatments. And nothing about this is going to be easy. There is no easy solution here, and you're going to be living with obesity for the rest of your life. Now, you might have controlled obesity that's being managed, but you're not getting rid of it. Right? You're always going to be living with this condition, and that's why it's a chronic condition. Okay, and that's disheartening, but so what? People live with other chronic conditions, they, they manage. Right? It's not hopeless. You know, having diabetes, you're going to live for the rest of your life with diabetes. Well, that's not hopeless, right? because we've got treatments. Yeah, and I think, and I think, uh, <clears throat> I think Rami, the, the other, the other, I understand it's a, it's a great question about striking the balance between you know, um, uh, placating patients from indiv individual responsibility for taking some, you know, control and self-management of, of, of their, you know, dietary and physical activity behaviours. I think the other sort of distinction is that uh, you have to, we have to accept that, you know, uh, being overweight now is, is more normal than, than having a healthy weight. So we, we have to, I think if you, if you if you did that approach that, that Professor Sharma was suggesting was to um, recognise that it's a disease, recognise that, you know, they are part of the majority of the population. Now, people who are living with excess body weight are now the majority of the population. And then really, um, I, I think it's, a, it's valid to then call it for what it is. You know, it isn't really their fault that, that they are carrying this excess body weight because if it, if it was, it, it, it would be a minority sort of. Uh, uh, more minority uh, condition. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I would add to that. I would say even if it is their fault, yeah. so what? Yes. That's I mean, people who have heart disease, I would argue that you know, half those guys shouldn't be having heart disease. They probably did it to themselves anyway. I'm still providing care and I'm still providing treatment. I mean, the, you know, the guy who gets, you know, who has a, ha, you know, has a couple of beers too many and gets into his car and doesn't, you know, and runs, the, and gets into a car accident. Well, you know, a stupid guy, but he still gets all the services. Uh, so yeah. it doesn't matter whether they did it to themselves or not. It, that's that's it's not my 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 job to judge whose fault this is. It's not and about I, finding fault. And I think that's a that's a key uh, important distinction actually because uh, uh, you know inferring that something's preventable, and and the point you made that and we all understand that that living with obesity is chronic and 
and it's actually it's it's a falsehood to to claim that it is preventable. It's it's even well, nobody's preventing it yet. We so. can't prevent it. We can't even manage it. Catherine Samaras, thank you very much. Um, after 20 years of working in the HIV lipodystrophy area and almost 10 years now in antipsychotic induced obesity, uh, I've had the privilege of engaging with the advocacy groups. The HIV groups, gosh, they are aggressive. They're the, be they're the best. Even, even with people with schizophrenia who are engaged as consumers, people with lived experience, and they are engaged at every level of, um, of research and policy making, they will stand up and say, I have schizophrenia. When I get in invited to do interviews for media and they say, oh, but we would want a patient to talk about their obesity because, you know, who wants a talking head? We want somebody with the condition. I cannot convince any patient to stand up publicly and say, I struggle with obesity, I have all these problems, I've had surgery, I lost, you know, 60 kilos but I can't find those patients. Yeah. How do we engage? Well, that's I was so impressed you had a web page full of people. Oh that yeah, you fantastic. should listen, listen to story. I think there's 50 stories now up there. I'm not, you could say, well, there's How 7 million people. That? You should be able to find 50 guys who can yeah. talk about it. How did you get Right. That? I mean, it's not a rare disease. That's the good thing, right? If I can get one person of people to engage, I got 70,000 people who will engage, right? This is not a rare disease. You've got to find those few people. And I can tell you ultimately what changes policy is one, is one story. One story from one person on the front page and all of the media will change the entire narrative. Right? You can be doing this, you know, this research in 10,000 people and nobody cares, and then you have this one story and that changes everything. So you gotta look for those stories, and you gotta bring those stories out. And those stories exist, you know they exist, I know they exist, but you gotta get people out to tell those stories. Hi, uh, thanks again for a terrific talk, um, Alex from uh, Melbourne. I wanted to pick on something that you you just got into there, and I think that's um, I think the other myth, as well as the idea of preventability, is the idea of treatability, or from this, that this is a fixable problem. Um, because I think in our patient population, we see a group that have faced a lot of stigma to even come and see us, and then the devastation faced by someone who's been through the full gamut of treatment, had weight loss surgery, the rest of it, and then the weight regained. Um, and, and that becomes really difficult because they, they almost there's a stigma from the other treated patients. You know, Absolutely, like, yeah. oh, well, I had my surgery and I lost 50 kilos. What's wrong with you? And, and I think that that's another area where the myth is driving a, a lot of disengagement. Absolutely. So, as, so the first thing I would say to that is uh, patients don't fail treatments. Treatments fail patients. Okay, so if this treatment has not for, worked for you, it's not your fault. It's just maybe it wasn't the right treatment or wasn't enough of the treatment. And sorry, we don't have other treatments. But again, you know, there are lots of conditions for which we don't have good treatments. You know, but we don't, we don't say, well, now that's the patient's fault. I mean, there, you know, there's all kinds of conditions that we, have, we don't have good treatment. So that's one of the first things I tell people. I say, you know what? Hey, I wish you had, I mean, if you're frank, I mean, there's a lot, we, we have better treatments for cancer than we have for obesity. You know, cancer we can cure, obesity I've never cured. So, uh, but we need to be open about it. Now, one of our big problems is, I didn't even get into that, is the commercial weight loss industry. Because the commercial weight loss industry, and that includes everybody who's ever written a diet book, and everybody who's got a you know, website, and everybody who wants to sell you whatever they have. These guys are all in the business of telling you that there is an easy solution. And with all of their anecdotal stories about the before and the afters and the fat burners and whatnot, those guys have a vital interest that this never becomes a disease. Because the minute this becomes a disease, their weight loss is now a treatment for a disease, and suddenly they fall under regulations which they don't want to fall under. See, nobody's running the local you know, cancer cure center because they're not allowed to. Okay? There's no local diabetes thing that you can walk to because, you know, you don't have a medical license, you're not allowed to run that center. But because it's not a disease, you can do whatever you want, right? So the, the unregulated, non-regulated <laughs> weight loss industry, which is a billion dollar industry, they have absolutely no interest in this ever being considered an obesity. They like the eat less, move more activity. I mean, that's what keeps gyms in business. People don't go there for cardiovascular fitness. No, they go there for weight loss. When we all know, <laughs> that that's not the most efficient way to lose weight, right? But that's what keeps them in business. They don't, they, don't want, they don't want this to not be about exercise and not be about... So, so 
you know, we are facing that. That is, that, is, that is a heavy headwind that we have to fight up against. And what they promise and what they advertise is not what we can offer. We, I mean, you know, I don't even get results like that with bariatric surgery. And they claim they can get that with, you know, your personal trainer at your local gym. It's nonsense. Right? But they can advertise that they can talk about it. I can't because I'm regulated. Thank you, Tony. And then Nick. Uh, Tony from Sydney again, uh, Aria. I was absolutely impressed by how silent the room was during your talk. <laughs> you could literally not hear, well, hear a pin fall to the ground. It was just absolutely amazing. So I think your point was imp incredibly impressively made. So thank you very, very, very much. Of course, our patients are our best advocates. We live in a world of social media. And what I really want to know from you is your experience, especially in Canada, yeah. whether social media has had a positive or negative impact in terms of weight stigma and discrimination. Yeah. And I come from the, from the point of view of one of my patients has formulated one of the largest social media support groups in, in, in one aspect of bariatric surgery. Well, what I want to know from you is, has social media had a positive or negative impact? Yeah. Yeah, I think overall it's starting to have a positive effect, although you have to be very careful with social media because social media, is, there are tribes that happen, right? I mean, so I, so I don't know about Canada, but there are people who are totally opposed to the whole idea that obesity is just something that, you know, we have made up because we want to stigmatize people, and there's a whole group of people out there who are, uh, you know, who will refuse to talk about weight loss and who will refuse to talk about obesity management because... I mean, they're like the anti-vaxxers or the, or the climate change deniers, right? I mean, 97% of the world experts say this, this is human, but no, but they're the ones. No, but there have always been, you know, ups and downs in earth temperature, and so this is all nonsense, right? So you've got that community. Now, they can get very vocal, and they can attack you on social media. Uh, you can't argue with them because they're not rational people. Uh, they are not recipient to science. Most of them have zero scientific understanding, no scientific background, but they have strong beliefs, which is their right, I guess. Uh, but that's where a lot of the opposition can come from, and uh, well, you just power through anyway, right? Uh, because the one thing we have going for us is the science and the evidence. And if, when the evidence changes, we change our messages. Well, they don't, because they don't worry about the evidence. Their message stays the same, even if the if the facts, you know, if the science changes, it doesn't really change what they say and what they believe. Uh, one of the issues you, you have as you start engaging patients is it's, it's, it's very hard for patients very often to go beyond their own story. So, uh, and, and, and you often find this, which is why you need a diversity of opinion, because everybody has their own story. And what worked for one patient does not necessarily work for the next patient. Uh, and you sometimes run into these patients who think they have found the cure because they have managed their obesity, and this is, you know, so I did keto, and I still do keto, and it works for me. It's great, so everybody needs to be doing keto. Or I had bariatric surgery. It worked great for me, and so now everybody needs bariatric surgery. So, so they, you know, they, look at, they look at their story, and then they take their story and think that, that's, that they have found the cure. So, so you have to be slightly wary about those patients. I mean, of course, it works for them, which is good, but that doesn't mean that the next guy you know, is going to respond the same. So... Uh, so but that, that needs, needs guidance, and you, know, you do need to look at that. I mean, peer support groups, I mean, there's, there's literature on peer support groups that are, that are patient-run and that are sort of mediated peer support groups. And it's usually when, the, when these support groups are, 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 are professionally mediated, they tend to be better, because otherwise they can run amok. You know, they run off into these little mm. things. And, and, and you see that when you look at a lot of the peer support groups, that some of the things that are being talked about and advocated there are not really evidence-based, they're anecdotal. And, uh, so, so there's an issue there. So you can't just, you know, just, okay, let's get them all to talk. Uh, you have to manage it, but it can be managed, and I think it's important to manage it. And uh, the last question from Nick. Um, Nick Hormis from Sydney. Aria, bias amongst our colleagues. Recently, I've been to two diabetes conferences. One was in the US, and one was here in Australia. Despite 50% of the diabetes population would be helped by managing their weight, the conference probably had 1% content. You know, sure. how do we change that? I think part of it is having more effective treatments. You know, I think there's a lot of inertia largely because we don't have good treatments. That, you know, I, you, know you can have the scenario of, you know, the enthusiastic medical school graduate who 
big believer in diet and exercise and you know I want to focus my practice on weight loss and then they get do it and they do it for a year and then after have great success initially and then after two years they realize they're wasting their time because everybody keeps putting the weight back on and ultimately this is the salt stuff doesn't work it's a waste not a good use of my time I don't want to do this anymore but but that has to do I understand why that happens but it largely happens because we don't have an effective treatment. Once, the treat, once you actually have an effective treatment and you know how to use the treatment, people will actually start seeing the results. And we are just going through that phase in Canada. Now that we have access to drugs that actually work and that people can actually take and that actually have positive outcomes, a lot more people are getting much more enthusiastic about it. Right? Because you have treatments. If you don't have a treatment that works, well, then there's nothing for me to do. And then really, honestly, you are wasting my time. So I think part of it, it has to be, we, need, we desperately need treatments in obesity that actually work. But, but as you said, we do have some treatments now that... Yeah, but they take time to catch on. I mean, by the time we get the studies and then they get into the guidelines, then it also becomes a culture of practice. And remember, none of these guys have learned how to manage obesity in school. So uh, I didn't learn how to manage obesity in school. Please thank Professor Shaw. Thank you very much. Thank you.